Hey, it's time for the Maximum PC No BS podcast, episode 243. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about audio, specifically 3D audio for virtual reality. Uh, and all that is coming up soon. So welcome back to the Maximum PC No BS podcast. Uh, we actually have a special guest company with us today, OSIC. They specialize in 3D audio for VR, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves to you guys. Hi, I'm Jason Riggs, uh, CEO of OSIC. I'm uh, Joy Lyons. I'm the Chief Technology Officer. So. Welcome to the podcast, you guys. Um, can you guys give us maybe uh, an intro about yourselves personally, where you guys come from, what you guys have done, and then we can kick kick off to the company. Sure. Yeah, I'm sort of uh, how I how I got here and how we ended up at OSIC, I guess, is is really uh, personally for me two interests. So, you know, I started building speakers when I was 14 years old and was always an audiophile and sort of into it and. Um, yeah, studied engineering at school, went to work for Pioneer, designing speakers and transducers. Um, eventually was recruited by Logitech, went up there, did a lot of PC speakers, iPod speakers, um, and gaming headphones. Um, started the acoustic department there, grew a pretty big team out, and did a lot of audio products. And so um, that was sort of the, the pre osic and definitely, yeah, learned a lot about... Uh, some of the challenges with spatial audio from a lot of the surround sound gaming headphones cool. that we had we had done and designed. So, um, and then the the other side for me was really um, I've been a gamer. I mean, since I was a kid, I was a programmer on a Commodore sixty four. You know, I wow. grew, grew up with it, and um, you know, all through college and all that, I built my own PCs. I mean, that was sort of probably part of your core audience here, I think. And uh, so, it really for me, it's just been like the passion of the love of gaming combined with my love of audio that sort of led up to the creation of this company. So which which one are you more, a gamer or an audiophile? Hmm. Well, I mean, I make less time for gaming than I, I used to, although we do sort of do, uh, we get a couple hours in a week anyway. So so Joy and I, we've game for, she was actually the first person I hired at Logitech quite some time ago. And uh, we used to do like um, World of Warcraft, two versus two arena, and we, we play LOL and stuff. So we're not super uh, competitive, cool. but we definitely, we play some team stuff. So... I actually probably make more time for gaming than I do for like listening lately. Cool. Enjoy. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I studied physics and music uh, and acoustics. So um, this is sort of a dream project for me to actually get to really dive into some um, technology that sort of melds those two together. Uh, but I also worked at Logitech, made a lot of products, um, a lot of audio products and learned, you know, what people really like, what they don't like. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited basically, to work on this project. So That's so since yeah, so since you specialize in acoustics, did we set up this booth properly? Uh, I, it's Do we very, need more DBA panels? I, I think it's, it's actually quite nice. Okay. Cool. I was a little worried when I walked in, I'm not going to lie, but uh, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Um, so can you guys uh, walk through our readers about what OSIC does and what it intends to do? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll feel that. So... Uh, I mean, we're working on the ultimate 3D listening experience, and, you know, we really have, um, the, the only mission we have for our company is to be able to accurately recreate 3D in a way that's indistinguishable from reality on headphones, okay? So that's the problem that we're solving, and, uh, you know, we really have sort of three metrics that we hold what we're doing to. Um, first is, like, can we put sounds in anywhere, anywhere in space and have a whole range of people believe that they're there? So that's sort of like, let's call it angular spatial accuracy. Uh, the second one is, can we really believe that we have that out-of-head localization so when we start to try to render depth? Uh, and then the third one is just the sound quality. So those are kind of the metrics we're, we're putting this against. And it turns out that, uh, you know, doing really accurate spatial audio in headphones is hard. Uh, I mean, our auditory system, fundamentally headphones, if we don't put any 3D algorithm, we just put some headphones on, they render a very close personal experience, right? So if something's panned to the left, it's absolutely at the left. If something's panned to the right, it's at the right. And the rest kind of is a very close in your head. And so, you know, I hear people all the time talking about imaging on headphones, but the reality mm -hmm. is headphones don't image like a great set of speakers outside of right. your head. And the, the challenge with 
a lot of the algorithms that have been put on before these sort of you know virtual surround sound algorithms and things that that you download is in general um, they're generic and by generic I mean they don't know about the device that you're rendering with how it interacts with your ears um, they don't know about your anatomy they don't know about your ear shape and so they're, they're all based on this head related transfer function sort of model but usually they use a dummy head and unfortunately where that anatomy is different from your anatomy that just doesn't work and uh, what you get usually is you get the sound on the sides gets expanded mm -hmm. you struggle with the front rear also above and below if you're trying to do that. Um, it, they just don't consistently work for a range of people. But then the worst part is that the sound quality suffers. So you, you turn on, you get a little more spaciousness at the expense of sound quality because you're effectively listening through someone else's ears. Mm -hmm. If you're using over ears, you're listening through part of your ears and somebody else's ears in the algorithm, which is a really unnatural uh, experience. So yeah, what we're trying to do really, it's maybe a little different is deep integration of the hardware and the software in a way that when you put the headphones on, they measure your head. They measure your ear spacing. They calibrate to your ears. And so you get a customized HRTF or head related transfer function. And uh, that allows us to very much mimic what you could get with actual sounds in space. So we get great out of head localization and we can put sounds anywhere. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, kind of the problem we're tackling. So when you guys use HRTFs um, and for uh, those who don't already know, um, it's basically using a modeled ear and measuring how sound uh, interacts with that ear model, mm -hmm. essentially, right? And then that technology has been around for a good number of years, mm -hmm. I think dating back to even before the 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and people and gamers actually might remember a company called Oriel 3D um, that brought kind of HRTFs to the consumer sound space market. Um, and Creative Labs later bought them out um, and I haven't personally seen A3D technology used since, but it might be integrated into Creative's EAX technology, but they really haven't talked about that for quite a number of years. Um, so in a nutshell, does, does your technology get based off of that, or is it something much more evolutionary or revolutionary? Um, I, I would, uh, I'll, I'm going to let Joy answer <laughs> some of the, the revolutionary part of it, um, apart from, you know, like there was definitely this surge in the mid to late 90s, right? When right. 3D games were, I mean, you know, I remember like quite distinctly, maybe 1980, 98 or 99, like I had built like this first AMD Athlon machine and I had my Oral 3D card and I had Half-Life and it was just like the first experience that was actually immersive enough on the PC to be kind of scary. You know, I mean, it was just so like coming around the corner and so, there was a lot of cool things done since then, I'm, um, are, are done at that time, you know, the, the energy around it. Unfortunately, they've kind of kind of tapered down. But, you know, what I saw, I just happened to go back this morning and I was listening to some clips of Half-Life on the Oriole thing that people had posted on YouTube because I was kind of thinking about this um, before coming here about, you know, machines I built and kind of the 3D, the 3D audio history. Um, but, you know, the when I did go back and listen to it, it, it actually is still quite weak in, in the front, in the middle sort of the zone. And so uh, it has a great environmental modeling and then, you know, it, it does this great things out to the side, but um, the, the real challenges are, we have two sensors. I mean, our head is not so different than a bowling ball with two microphones on the side. Mm -hmm. And so the core of, uh, well, why don't, you, why don't you take it and get into the tech about the, how you would decompose the HRTF and like what, sure. what signals are they? Like how are we figuring out sounds are in space with only two ears, right? Sure, so um, I mean, what we're, we're approaching it basically from the scientific background, so going back and understanding the literature. So people have been studying how people localize sound for many decades actually. Um, and then we're taking approach coming from the product side where we you know worked on mass consumer, how can we take something from the lab and really translate it into a product that somebody can actually use? Uh, and so for how you hear sounds in space, there's uh, several mechanisms. Um, so the head-related transfer function, there's the a time delay. So let's imagine you have a sound in front of you. Uh, maybe it's slightly to the right. Um, it's going to reach your right ear before it reaches your left mm -hmm. ear, just, you know, time of flight. Uh, and then also, if it's closer to your right ear than it is to your left ear, it's going to be a little bit louder. Uh, and then also your head is going to block a little bit of sound at the higher frequencies to the off ear, we would call it. Um, so those are time and level differences. And additionally, there's what we would call spectral differences. So if you can imagine your ear has lots of different little ridges in it, uh, and each of these fig uh, little you know, figures, they interact with the sound um, at different frequencies, and they create sort of spectral shifts. So this is sort of timbre shifts or 
you know, if you can imagine going on a little EQ slider or something, this, these would be very specific uh, bumps and dips in the uh, frequency domain. Um, so those are three of the mechanisms uh, that help us localize sound. And so there's actually a fourth, which is um, your position in space. Uh, and so using these four mechanisms, um, we're decomposing the set related transfer function into each of those and we're solving them separately. Mm -hmm. And that way in the device itself, we're doing in situ measurements of the person and then uh, reconstructing what they would have heard if a sound had actually been occurring in the space. Um, so again, if a sound is occurring in space, it's setting up a 3D sound field. So, you know, sound directly in front of me is going to send sound throughout the room. It's going to interact with the walls and then reach me from various angles. Um, and if it's in front of me and then I turn to the side, uh, it's now 90 degrees to me. Uh, and so we need to account for the fact that you're panning through a whole range of HRTFs as you move your head around. And all this information, you're, you know, this is how you learned how to localize sound. Um, and all of that's been missing. So it's not just a simple static HRTF for maybe each mm -hmm. of the seven channels. It's actually a huge number um, that's constructed for you using the different components that we measure in the device. And then also panning across all of them to make sure that you believe that there's an actual sound field that's being created um, around you. So it's, it's basically an infinite number of HRTFs, essentially, depending on how you position your head in the environment at any given point in time. It, it is, and the, really the key part is calibrating it to your HRTF. So yeah. everyone's HRTF is different. Right. So if we look at like an adult population, the size of our ears vary two to one. So the smaller end is around 47 millimeters high, the high end is around 90. All these dimensions vary. Not just the dimension, the angles, the shapes, these unique things. That so. <laughs> Like if we think about the, the two main cues, the first ones are this level and delay thing. And that's like what, what a generic HRTF gets right. And so the, the neat thing is our sensors are lined up this way. So almost any of these 3D algorithms do a pretty good job at the right and the left. I mean, the sound comes out to the right, it comes out to the left, because there's one point, for one point here, there's one set of delays, there's one set of levels. Mm -hmm. Our heads only vary about plus or minus 15%, so we, roughly we get it. Put the sensors this way, we get it. Now, as Joy mentions, let's say sound's out here at 45 there's another point up here, and another point back here, and another point down here that all have the exact same delay pass to the ears and the exact same level. So as soon as we move off to the side, there's a whole range that that, that delay and that level could represent. And then it gets even worse as we move to the center. When we move to the center, there's no difference in delay. There's no difference in level anywhere right in this circle. So this region is called the cone of confusion, and it's harder for us in real life, you know, to get the sounds front and rear. Even forget about recreating it in headphones. And so, as you mentioned, like the movement's really important, micro movements of your head, like as soon as you move this, you know, so we have head tracking on the headphones, which is if you're using it for non-VR, so let's say you're playing Counter-Strike, great. Of course, I mean, you can flick your character back and forth, but let's say you're looking through a wall and you're waiting for someone to come up and, you know, you potentially want to shoot through a wall or something. You only need to move your head like a degree to be able to lock that in with head tracking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So head tracking is cool in that scenario. I mean, in VR, you have head tracking tied to effectively what would be mouse look, and so we default to like the head tracker that's in the VR. So if we're doing something on the Vive, you're using the Vive tracking, that tracking's awesome. Um, so that tracking is important, but the problem with the tracking is that you have to move within the sound. You have to sample it twice, right? So if there's a gunshot, like head tracking is not gonna help you. If there's 20 gunshots in a row from the exact same location, like head tracking will help you, right? The one gunshot, you need to hear it at two positions to resolve that. Mm. So that's where your anatomy really comes in because you know our ears are quite different from the front and the back. And so that's where the spectral cues from the reflection go, oh no, this is the front, not the back. I see. And um, so you know, again, it depends, you need both. Okay, first off, you do need head tracking. To, to create the illusion that sounds are somewhere in space and that they're fixed, right. they have to stay. Right. As soon as they turn with your head, it kind of like collapses, just like VR. Right, like VR would not be VR if it had no head tracking. Right, it was just right. a screen attached to your face that moved around with you. That's not realistic. Um, audio is exactly the same. So head tracking is important. Um, the anatomy is really important, not just to get spatially accurate, especially to get this whole middle zone, um, but then also to sound right because listening through someone else's ears and ear model is right. weird and it just trashes the sound quality. So. Um, yeah, that's that's why those are kind of our three metrics. So you know, and it, is it more difficult to do it through headphones because of how the drivers are placed right next to your ear versus like a speaker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, so you know, our approach is how do we do the H -H HRTF for the individual, uh, and we have a range of solutions for different form factors. But absolutely, you need to consider what the device is. Uh, and so our first product is a circumoral headphone. 
Uh, and so for that, you actually have the entire ear. Covered. Uh, yeah. And so uh, you have to be very careful about what part of the HR tech you do include versus not including. Mm -hmm. And so the first product has multiple drivers in it. It actually has four per side. Uh, and then we're beating oh, the wow. sound across the different zones. Um, so we do, you know, breaking apart the HRTF, we, we process um, part of your information into it, and then we use the natural interaction with your ear from the proper angle uh, to capture the high frequencies, which, um, which is the yeah. area that And it's a little different than, than maybe what's been done before. So yeah. I mean, there have definitely been some headphones where people... You know, put a number of drivers in them and then yeah. just plug them into the different channels. Yeah, it doesn't just, work. They just don't yeah. work. I mean, that has that that's not going to work. Oh. Um, but you know what we're doing with the um, the little drivers is just at high frequency, getting the right the angle of interaction to your right. to your pinna. Okay, and so that's it's just one part of the HRTF. Um, but think of it the other way. What you said is absolutely correct, right? So if I take it over the ear and I put it on like this, my ear is still there. So if we were going to even calibrate it for you, the first thing we would need to do before we put on a model for someone else's ears is take your, mo your ear off. Well, so, so you, I mean, it's the first problem. If you see a generic um, software that does the, you know, 3D rendering or some HRTF thing, you know, if it doesn't have some difference for in-ears versus on-ears versus over-ears, that's like a first warning sign, right? Because actually most of these models, people take HRTFs that were created at some university. So we do our own, we record them, but... Most of them seem to use some data set from 30 years ago that someone recorded at MIT or IR Cam or wherever. So those were all recorded at the ear canal, right? And so, so actually they kind of make more sense for earphones, not for headphones. And mm -hmm. so when you render them back with headphones, now you also have your ear. And it's super hard because exactly what you said, right? There is an actual speaker right there, and it is bouncing off your pinna from that angle. And we're pretty good at knowing that. And so whatever we do to put this trickery over top of it, half of the cues are telling us it's here, it's here. Mm -hmm. And then some other cues are saying, oh, maybe it's somewhere else, but those aren't your cues. So what we see when we map it, like we do subjective panels, blind testing, we bring people through, we put the sounds at different points in space, we map where they're supposed to, you know, where they're supposed to be versus where they think they are. Um, and with all these generic things, it's kind of a butterfly, like the, the right and left work, and then this whole part, some people might hear it in the front, some might hear it in the back, but most are just confused, and so it it's kind of still ends up being here. Uh, and that, that's, those are the things where your ear and head tracking um, and your anatomy calibration fill that circle in, and we get like 90, 95% correlation once those two pieces are in place. So it's a big, uh, big difference in immersion, but again, it's really filling out the whole sphere and being able to have the pinpoint front, back, above, below. Mm -hmm. I, I was just about to ask you guys, actually, because I've I've seen headphones with multiple drivers mm -hmm. in them, and I was wondering if even with the HRTFs um, being calculated in real time, you still need multiple drivers to achieve like the the best possible immersion mm -hmm. effect versus two, or can it can you suffice with just two drivers? So our our first goal with this product is um, the moonshot of the entire project was how can somebody just put the headphone on and it just works immediately. Mm -hmm. can, can we even yeah. maybe back up we and explain like how lab calibration works? Sure. Is, that, is that cool? Or, yeah. Um, oh yeah, because the headphones will calibrate itself yeah. to yeah. your to the user. So yeah. there have been these systems like mostly in academia and used for research and um, for some time. And if we take you to like an anechoic chamber and we sit you in the chamber and we put microphones in your ear uh, and then we have a speaker that or a big array of speakers that goes around you and you know, each one fires off and we measure your impulse. We'll cap that's how you capture an HRTF. Okay, so it's some spatial resolution, 15 degrees, 5 degrees, 1 degree, however many measurements you want to take. Mm -hmm. And we're measuring the impulses at your ears. That's your HRTF, right? So those, those have existed. And, you know, we had the opportunity to benchmark a lot of those and could see that they just absolutely work. I mean, if I can take you to chamber, measure you six hours, put it in a super fancy DSP, give you head tracking, like you will believe the sound is there and the correlations are 90-some you know, oh, wow. percent. That works. It's actually been known for some time. Um, so the challenge we were trying to solve was like, cool, well, you know, it, it's a little impractical for us to take everyone to a $5 million chamber and measure right. it for a whole day. Like, how expensive is that? Right. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're using multiple drivers in a way probably different than it's ever been done before, but we're, we're synthesizing your HRTF out of a few different things. So the low frequency part, it's about the size of your head and the distance of your ear. That gets the ILD right, the ITD. So those level differences, those time differences based on space, is based on your ear spacing, your head size, even your torso a little. So we're measuring that with physical sensors. Uh, but for the ear, we could put a microphone in your ear, and we could use our little drivers to calibrate around it at different angles. But we really had this moonshot, which was 
what, what Joy's point was, which was, hey, what if people didn't have to do weird shit? You know, what if it was just like you put it on and it worked? Right? That was the user experience that we wanted to achieve. Mm-hmm. And so to, to do that, um, we do that high-frequency part in real time so that we don't have to put the microphones in your ear, but you are still getting the exact interaction you would get from a speaker at some point in space to your pinna. That's just like the above 2 kilohertz. That's the kind of pinna piece of it. Everything else is really in the, the HRTF model in software, which is just learning about your position in space, learning about your head size, learning your ear spacing. So is there an actual microphone in the ear, in the headset too that takes the measurements, or no. how does it work? Oh, no, no, really? Uh, it's it's synthesized without the microphone, just just because the high frequency playback. Um, well, we use the indirect sensors for the lower models, and then the uh, actual acoustic interaction is your natural interaction because it's circumoral, and we have those drivers at the different locations. Uh, we can. We know what the interaction would be like just by feeding the signal through and then the sound will come out those different angles. We do have a microphone um, array on it, so for gamers you can absolutely do communication. Yeah, um, that's a, just a yeah, different feature. Something kind of kind of neat we're doing on the microphone side, um, but it, it's a, a pretty high-end six microphone array and so what you can get is um, the noise rejection you get of a boom, but one advantage uh, over a boom system is you know, boom is, is it really relies on being close to your mouth, right, to get a lot of the noise cancellation. And so the downside to that is if you bump it or you move it a little, your voice levels drastically change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, build this system that gives you that same noise rejection with an array of microphones, but that's less sensitive to placement. So your, your level when you're talking is always consistent. I mean, it's really important for like a vent or mumble or something. A lot of those um, voice over IP, they have uh, algorithms for, for noise control on them, and sometimes they just cut off your voice because uh, you've actually changed sensitivity by moving the, you know, the boom. And so by keeping the consistent level, it, you know, it, it gets rid of a lot of issues you might have with uh, communicating real time during games. Yeah, I mean, especially if you, if you don't have push to talk or something, yeah. if you're just doing it based on level, having that threshold right, be right. consistent is nice. Yeah. So in terms of the the gaming audience that we've seen recently, there's been a trend of, well, obviously headphones are now like this huge gold rush uh, in the consumer space and everybody, you know, Mm -hmm. is doing it. Um, I think we can all thank Beats for that trend. Um, But there's a lot of gamers now who are, who have been using quote unquote gaming headsets, Mm -hmm. which in my opinion and not to offend any particular manufacturers of gaming headsets but I don't feel they're made of very high quality mm-hmm. yeah. they're you know they're tr- kind of treated by the manufacturers as commodity yeah. me too products and you know let's just get into that space because so and so company is making money in that space um, and so what we've been recommending and what we've seen in the community too is people are now buying actual audio hi-fi level mm-hmm. headphones, just normal headphones, and then attaching a separate mic, like a boom mm-hmm. mic, that's attachable to the headphones. So like, for example, in the in the audio space for gamers, the um, the Sennheiser HD 595, I believe, is, is like a really popular model. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's good, it's affordable, mm-hmm. and Sennheiser is a good name. So where in, once your product comes out, where in terms of the headphone mm-hmm. level would that stand like can I use your headset as you know just a tool to enjoy music mm-hmm. or is it like predominantly geared towards gaming how, how does that work I mean absolutely so uh, one of the benefits of actually calibrating to your HRTF is the sound quality goes up quite a bit so how normal headphones are EQ'd I mean most people probably don't know this but um, they know that there's a spatial problem, so a lot of times they do an EQ, it's called a diffuse field correction, which is they just average every angle for the dummy to just try to wash out any sort of information because they know it's going to be wrong. The, the dummy head. That's the dummy head, the which is not your head. Uh, yeah. And then also, there's two problems, right? It's not your head, uh, and then the second problem is that it's this sort of washed out um, average of every angle. Um, but if you actually have your head and your ear in the model, number one, sound quality goes way up, and then you also have spatial accuracy because... Um, we can also position sounds uh, at precise locations instead of trying to sort of lay that on top of this uh, sort of washed out model. Uh, so absolutely sound quality. We were talking to a lot of people in the um, development community, people who do you know mixing in the studios and whatnot, and they're very excited. Um, and they've heard it, and they're really excited about the sound quality and spatial positioning. Because for sure headphones, you know, they're, they don't use them a lot in audio mixing. Um, just because there's a lot of variability across people. So most of the spe- um, 
excuse me, most mixing is actually done on speakers. And so it's a way of actually replicating like a really uh, natural and realistic sound field um, for everybody with the headphone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, we're, we're hopefully, well, next week, I think we'll announce an interesting partnership with, with one of the most famous recording studios in, in the world. And, uh, you know, we've, I guess our take on it is like, because I think we're equally frustrated and haven't been in this, this space for a while. Um, if I go to eSports tournament, I see like half the people now, you know, who are showing up and, and doing some of these wearing a music headphone, right? So, so this sort of phenomenon you talked about, and, you know, there absolutely is a quality element um, as, to, as to why that is. And so it's like, if you think, what does a gaming headset differentiate from from music headset? And it's like, well, it has a microphone. It may have some some virtual surround thing, which actually, from what we've seen, for most of them, is it like it gives you a little bit of spatial effect at the expense of sound quality. So that that's not, you know, for people who care about the sound quality, that might not add any value. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, it's like they're cheap, you know. And I, I think, um, you know, I mean, there's there's a, a lot of times, you know, it's it's about. I guess what. What we have, it looks like a, a high-end studio headphone. Everything is aluminum. This thing is not like, there's no plastic. It's bomb-proof. You know, it, it, all of our frustration with cheap gaming headphones has basically gone into making what would be the ultimate gaming headphone. And I was kind of famous for breaking headphones. I, mean, I, I would beta test all these headphones what we would do, and I literally, like, 17 in a row, I busted them because I was maybe aggressive or I'd yank out the cord or, you know, what, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, I can't stand it. You know, I can't stand cheap shit that breaks. And so, so... Um, but the way we're looking at it is we want to flip that script, right? So, like, we have this kick-ass 3D audio headphone, and uh, it's amazing for gaming. It's amazing for VR. We're starting on that side. But we didn't want it to look, like, kind of pander to gamers, right? It's not, we're not putting green stripes and 50 LEDs mm -hmm. on it and all mm -hmm. this shit. Like, it's about the sound quality. It's about, you know, it's, it's really just catered towards the people who want the ultimate sound quality. And the, the way we have it working and the connectivity, so it's USB, there's an application. If you want to, you know, download a decoder to do Dolby Atmos, or you want to do game engine integration, or you want to render a bazillion channels with this thing, and we're looking to support all the formats we can. So if it's Amazonic, if it's 22 channel, like we actually don't care, right? We can accurate, accurately render this. We're working with some of the big game companies on game engine integration so that we can get direct object rendering, right? Uh, but it also has a three and a half millimeter jack on it. And in the three and a half millimeter jack mode, it uh, basically we have a small DSP on it that can run all that processing in stereo. So if you're an audiophile and you just want amazing soundstage, I mean, you want to feel like you're in a listening room, you've got speakers in front of you or the musicians in the room and you have this really accurate frontal soundstage, you can just do that by plugging into it. Hmm. Um, but to go kind of beyond that, if you want to render 22 channel mix or, or 32 channel Atmos off a of Blu-ray or you, know, you want to, um, do all the things that's going, that are coming for VR and for gaming. Uh, in that case, it's running an application on PC or Mac. Cool. Um, it's one of my frustrations too because, like you mentioned in the beginning, imaging is a term often used for headphones. Um, and I would read a lot of reviews on on websites that are you know just geared towards headphones and audio in general. And I find that a lot of people talk about imaging and they can you know, they want a pair of headphones that can accurately place an instrument or mm -hmm. a singer mm -hmm. uh, where they should be in whatever recording environment that was done. Um, but I always hear them just in the middle of my head. They, they are. It, I mean, you have to think about this. It's like, I, I feel like, I mean, I cringe when I read all those reviews because like, okay, um, so like for a long time, like I just hated headphones uh, because, you know, I grew up building really amazing hi-fi speakers and they do they image properly right. and I've, I've tried every headphone and I mean you know I love high-end Sennheiser headphones they're, they're great headphones like for a reference they're amazing the basic there's all kinds of things that are amazing about listening on headphones that they do better than the speakers but imaging is a lot of them and when I hear people doing their reviews about the imaging and whatever I'm just like like are we are we were all listening to something different because here's the thing if you put a speaker right next to your right ear you know it's next to your right, right. ear Right, it's missing all of the cues. The spatial cues are, you know, real sound. We're talking. Your voice comes to this ear. It also comes to this ear. Right. There's there's some crosstalk there. There's level differences. You're interacting with my anatomy. And headphones just don't do that. Right. If you have no algorithm on them, the right is the right, the left is the left. And for me, and I think most people, the reality is the image is in head and very close. The center's here. So I, I think everyone, you know, they want them to image. They're imagining like in the good ones. Yeah. Maybe instead of here, it's here. Mm -hmm. But that's not. 
that's not an experience. And so I think looking forward to showing you some of the, the demos this afternoon, but I think you'll see that like we're talking about sounds, you know, 10 feet out of your head, not 10, 10 millimeters. Right. Um, I, I know too, there's a, there's a stereo recording technique that some, I guess, mixers use. I forgot the term, it's binaural mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, where it's, it's using a dummy head again. Yep. Um, and it, it gives somewhat of a pseudo effect of that yep. space. Yeah. Uh, separation, um, and I was listening to a track that was recorded using that technique, and the beginning of the track, someone was playing a clarinet, and w I hadn't heard that track before mm -hmm. I played it, and so when I played it, I thought that I had forgotten to mute my speakers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and it was really late at night, and I didn't want to disturb anybody, yeah. and so I was looking at you know, my yeah. DAC, and it, was, it said mute yeah. for the, the pre-outs already. And then I realized what I was hearing was in the headphones, yeah. but it didn't sound like yeah, it was in yeah. the, the headphones at all. But it couldn't move, obviously, with you know the yeah. movement of my, of my head. Yeah. It was just like there. Yeah. So whenever I turned my head, that sound would follow, but it was still like, you yeah. know, outside of the headphones. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty interesting too. But people say that that reduces the accuracy of the sound and all that it's, stuff. It's, you know, the core. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Like when you think about 3D sound built, uh, you can break it into like, uh, you know, there's an actual sound source, there's a room environment, and then there's a listener within that environment. Uh, and so what a binaural recording does really well is it captures all the characteristics of the source and the environment, but it doesn't really capture any of the characteristics of the, of, mm. well, I should say it captures the characteristics of the dummy head that was wearing it. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is you have a fixed frame of reference. Uh, and then you also have someone else's anatomy on there. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're not able to move around, and then you have some uh, degradation of sound quality associated with not having the head. But it's really good at capturing the actual um, spatial characteristics of the source, which a lot of models aren't very good at right now. Quite yeah, so be, be basically all, all of these models and all the virtual surround things are fundamentally based on a binaural technique, where they're trying to give you back the cues you had for your head. The neat thing about doing a binaural recording like Joy said, is if we put that actual head in a space, we still have the wrong anatomy. We don't have the tracking. Mm -hmm. that, that's a problem. But what we do have that's better than probably anything you've heard on virtual surround or with, with games is we have infinite spatial resolution. So, so if that reflection came from that point in space and it comes into this, we're not limited to trying to first pass it through five channels and then spatialize mm -hmm. it, right? It's like infinite channels. Now, unfortunately... The infinite channels are going to be mapped wrong because your ears are wrong and all the, all of these things. So you do lose some of that. But again, a, a good binaural recording, you know, quite good out to the sides, still struggles with the middle. Mm -hmm. But the sound quality does vary across people. And so all you know, really, all we're trying to do is that. But it doesn't have to be recorded as that form of content. Like we can capture it with the ambisonic mic for live capture. We can do other things to capture the sound field and then put your anatomy in. Because the problem is once you record it with that head and those ears, mm -hmm. that's the head and ears. You can't take them back off. But imagine we're, we're capturing this sphere that comes in, mm -hmm. and now we bring your anatomy in and all the individual cues to put, basically make a binaural recording with your head in it. But once we're in that sphere, with head tracking now, you can move within that sphere also. So the sphere stays fixed. The sphere, you know, if that's, again, that could be created in a game engine. So we have a lot of objects. We have, you know, we're queuing all the objects in real time to get their XYZ position. They're filling out this sphere effectively. They have different effects based on their depth also. Uh, but, but then we're putting your head in that as effectively the binaural listener and letting right. you move around within that space. So it's like you're you're producing the sounds and recording them without actually having a uh, an input head or mic in, in that specific position. So the game producer can create those sounds, place them anywhere they want, and then using your system, that's where the virtual head gets placed into that environment. Yeah. And then the sounds, whatever the producer created gets... Um, it interacts with that placement in yeah, real time. Absolutely, and I mean, you can almost think of it, you know, in, so, in some cases, you know, it is like a virtual array of speakers or something. So speakers interacting with your head are putting all these spatial cues in. But the cool thing with what's going to be possible with headphones is, you know, imagine having a listening room with an infinite number of speakers, right? We, we don't have to, we can have one degree spatial resolution, right? So the experience on headphones has the potential for 3D to be well beyond what could even physically be possible in any room with any speakers, with anything. But what speakers do really good is they sit at a point in space and they let all your cues there and they interact with you like they're supposed to and you believe the sound is there. 
So if you could have this infinite grid and be anywhere and be on your laptop and put this thing on and be in a room that maybe can't even exist, you know, that, that's the thousand speakers, the 3,000 speakers, and in terms of the pinpoint ability to image. Because, I mean, normally if we think surround sound, the big error with it is that it, it amplitude pans between the channels, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just fuzzier. And, and that, that whole idea of, like, 5.1 being an output for computer audio, like, it should have never happened. It really should have never happened. I mean, that was, you know, oh, we have four or five channels of room on the film from, you know, Surround Sound's invented in 1939. So Disney does Fantasia, and they're like, we well, got room for four tracks on the film. And, like, that's so for four speakers, right? But if we think 3D games, like, all the sound has been associated with objects. So, so now we're just starting to see object-based sound in the cinema, like with Dolby Atmos, where they're mixing as object. But we've had it in games forever. It's just it always got dumped out a 5.1 or a 7.1 mix. Mm -hmm. And with, with headphones, when, when those models are right for the HRTF, there's no point to limit us to five or seven channels. In fact, it's crazy because it, it just makes it more smeared between it when we're panning between it. Um, and so, yeah, all the things we're looking at and, and trying to also influence the content creators is really to unlock those options to have higher resolution outputs if that's more channels, if that's ambisonic, whatever those formats are, but at least put that option in the game. Um, and it, it's not so crazy for them. I mean, we can give them a mixer they drop in and with the plug-in in, in one minute, and we have output to way higher resolution. And then the rendering devices can evolve on the other side, the headphones, to accurately put those in space. So it's, um, it's um, exciting. Is, is the headset going to be, um, I guess, available to work with an existing system like if let's say a customer bought it for games but then now he wants to listen to music can he or she plug it into mm -hmm. like you know a standard receiver and enjoy the audio output through those headsets or mm -hmm. does it require yeah so basically um basically uh f for multi-channel right now we're starting with a computer um and so that that's usb based so if you you know Cool. If you're streaming something from your PC, feel free to plug it in and, and listen to it and have, you know, however many channels and what formats we can support, but uh, something probably way beyond what, what you've heard before. So we'll, we'll show you some Atmos demos running on it. Cool. It's pretty cool. Um, and then, of course, with the with stereo content, you know, it's got a three and a half jack, so you could sort of plug that into anything for the, the music and the stereo listening. And that process same for stereos is within the headphones, so you don't have to oh, really? tethered at that point. It'll just be oh, a three and a half millimeter. Jack. So ba yeah, basically right now the plan is to support uh, support all the stereo in the headphones, so that you can take it, plug it into your phone, do whatever you want to do with music. Um, but then once you want to go beyond that for the games, movies, VR you scenarios, you use a PC. I see. Because um, yeah, there's there's a little more horsepower that we're using there. So could I conceivably be listening to my favorite track, and then if I wanted to move the the sound stage forward so it, it makes me feel like I'm in an auditorium or something like that. Could I do that using a software tool or something mm -hmm. where I can slide the sound stage forward or backward yeah. or something? Yeah, we'll, uh, in some of the demos we'll let you basically, we can turn it on and off. We can also give you um, almost no room which gives you a slightly different presentation like a light room versus an actual listening room and so uh, we, we're definitely going to have different models that people can use for the room, for the speakers. And uh, it's, it's pretty accurate about recreating, recreating that. So I mean, I'm excited to be able to give someone a million dollar theater experience on headphones, right? To be able to watch this movie and say, yeah, that's 95% of what I heard in the actual theater. Um, but part of that is different things. So some people may like it a little more dry. Cool, let's do you know a mixing room with kind of near field monitor setup versus someone who maybe wants a listening room and the speakers are out 10 feet or something where you hear a little bit more of the room. And so uh, um, we're excited about, yeah, it, it's not, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of hokey room effects on receivers and all these kind of things, but this isn't what we're talking about. What we're talking about is really accurately modeling the sound in that room so that if you flip, it does exactly what you mentioned in the binaural recording, which is like we have a lot of people who hear it and go like, oh, cool, the headphones aren't on. And then they take them off and they like, wait, there's no sound in the room. Like, they do this double take, and it's like, no, that, that, those are the headphones, and they're just like looking for speakers or that's something, cool. right? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it can do that. Cool. Well, I know you guys have um, a Kickstarter going on. Um, what's, what can we expect in terms of ETA for product? Mm -hmm. We have, um, so the Kickstarter is launching uh, February 23rd, and uh, the we will have some of the units. I think the first unit shipping in November, um, but I, I probably shouldn't say more than that because I know they're still tweaking the rewards, but 
there's like um, there's some super early bird and some early bird and then like the regular Kickstarter ones. And so I think the dates may be staggered across those a little bit. Um, but we definitely will have some units in the hands of backers uh, before holiday. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we're pr- pretty excited about it. It's uh, we've been it's been kind of a, a project in some ways in the making for for ten or fifteen years in terms of the the dreams. But uh, we've been working on it uh, in earnest for almost two years as a team, and uh, it's a project we we would have a difficult time doing within the context of a large company um, because it's you know we, we we don't have to make any compromises, right? Right. And it, it's like we're just doing it the way we would want to do it. It's just a bomb-proof headset that does incredibly accurate 3D audio, and there's nothing else to it. You know, it has the kick-ass mic on it. Like that's it, and uh, um, you know. If you want a bunch of LEDs and you want everything to be green and whatever, like there's tons of stuff out there that are cool right, products, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you just care about the 3D audio, and and you know, if, you, if you're a Counter Strike player and you want to be competitive and you want an advantage because you can hear the audio within five degree accuracy instead of thirty degree accuracy, then you should buy this headphone. If you're a VR enthusiast and you're just like, I want the ultimate immersion, I want this thing, that's what it's for. You know, if, if you want just cool looking, you know, plastic stuff, then that's Definitely not what we're working on. Cool, cool. Well, that's about all the time we have today for the podcast. I'd like to thank Joy and Jason for coming over and sharing the details of their product. Um, you can find out more on their website. It is www.ossic.com uh, if you're interested. And you can find our podcast online at maximumpc.com. Mm-hmm.